Hello everyone and welcome to our first NPARC's One Million Trees webinar. My name is Zestin and I'll be your host for this afternoon. Thank you all for joining us on Zoom and on YouTube. In April this year, NPARC's kicked off our movement to plant a million trees across Singapore over the next 10 years. This movement will involve Singaporeans from all walks of life and complement our vision to transform Singapore into a city in nature. We are very excited to share with everyone more about the One Million Trees movement through events just like this one. So do look out for our updates on our website, trees.sg, and on our NPARC's social media channels. Today, we are privileged to have with us Mr. T. Sui Ping, Coordinating Director of Streetscape, and Dr. Adrian Liu, Group Director of Conservation and Wildlife Management, to share with us about the evolution of tree planting in Singapore. Here's our program for this afternoon. In the Singapore we know today, we experience lush greenery and can readily view a diverse array of beautiful trees in our urban environment. But how did this all start? In our first talk, Mr. T will be giving us an insight into our roots and share with us how the seeds of greening Singapore were sown. Next, how does greenery in Singapore look like now and where are we headed? Dr. Adrian Liu will take us through the plans of planting in Singapore into the future and how everyone can be involved in this movement. If you have any questions along the way, do send them to me, Zestin, as a private message using the Zoom chat. And we will try to answer some of these during the Q&A later before we wrap up. Now, without further ado, I'd like to invite Mr. T to share about Singapore's greening journey. Mr. T, please. Hi, hi, welcome friends. The greening of Singapore, how we have evolved through the years. I can assure you we have a truly unique story to tell on how Singapore was transformed into the premier tropical garden city known throughout the world today. Pardon me, please, because of time constraints, I have to go quite fast to narrate our Garden City story. Please do keep your eyes peeled because my slide carry more information than I can say. Please lend me your ears so that you may capture more fully my commentary. Long time ago, Singapore was called Tamase. And later, by the 15th century, it was called Singapore by Prince Sanila Utama, according to legend. Before reforms arrived, Singapore was largely a beautiful, pristine forest. Do you know that Singapore was sold to the British for 8,000 Spanish dollars? That was how modern Singapore was born. This beautiful drawing, a hand-colored lithograph entitled A Path Across the Swamp. The drawing is so beautiful, showing the undisturbed forests of Singapore in the early years. Notice the red ceiling wax farm at the center of the picture. It is a native plant commonly found in the swamp forests of Singapore. Singapore went on a fast track to develop as a trading port. The X-Men were sent in, they didn't miss the trees for the woods. So sad, down came the trees. In just less than 70 years, only 7% of the island's forests remained. But there was history and understandably in context, development had to take precedence over preservation of trees in this respect. Forest was cleared for development, for agriculture, to earn a living, to support livelihood of the people then, and for trade. Early settlers, mostly immigrants from China and India, they grew cash crops, vegetables, fruit trees. Some became farmers of poultry, pigs, and fish. Because of export demand, people started to have larger scale planting, the planting of plantation crops like Gambia. This plant was grown for its high tanning content for export overseas to Europe. Then people also 
planted pepper, cloth, nutmeg, they were all high value spices. I wish to single out one unique plantation tree and that is rubber. Rubber, botanical name, Helia brasiliensis. It is not native of Singapore, but it's originated from Brazil. In 1877, to cut the story short, 22 seedlings were especially arranged and brought to Singapore, specifically to Singapore Botanic Gardens. 12 numbers of the seedlings were planted in SBG and the other 10 saplings were sent to Malaya. That 22 original seedlings became parents to all the rubber tree in Southeast Asia today. Humanity owe much to this special man. H.M. Rickley. He was the first scientific director of Botanic Garden in 1888. Rickley contributed much to Singapore and the world. He was rubber planting. He was really mad because he carried rubber seeds in his pocket. And he literally soaked rubber seeds into people's hands and urged them to plant. Rickley promoted the hairy bone way of tapping rubber trees to extract the rubber latex, and this method of tapping is still being used today. Rickley was truly the father of rubber industry. By 1920, rubber plantations were established in Singapore and Malaya. Singapore, together with Malaya, became the largest world producer of rubber by 1930s. Not many people know this fact. Rickley's influence extended beyond his time. We only realized in recent years when Singapore Botanic Garden applied to be inscribed as a UNESCO World Heritage Site. One qualifying criterion is global contribution and Botanic Garden has fulfilled that role. We have to acknowledge it was through the singular efforts of Rickley, he was considered the man responsible for making Hevia brasiliensis that one tree species to be so significant for rubber has benefited mankind greatly. Singaporeans must be grateful to Rickley for that inscription, a very prestigious award indeed. It puts Singapore on the world map. Okay, rubber is a plantation tree, not a street tree. Let's look at the early years in 1881, Nathaniel Kangley helped to initiate the planting of some urban tree in a more organized manner. This picture is Orchard Road in 1900. You see some fruit trees planted along the roadside like coffee, nutmeg. This was Jalan Besar in 1910, planted with silk cotton trees, Seba Patandra. This is former Esplanade, it's now Connor Drive. Here the old road was, was lined with Ansana trees, Tericopus indicus, which were decimated by Fusarium osisporum, a fungal work disease that attacked primary, primarily Ansana trees. By 1920, all the Ansana trees along old Esplanade were replanted with rain trees. The rain trees along Connor Drive today, as you see in the picture, are over 100 years old, as, as shown. During this period, from 1959, when Singapore gained self-government until independence 1965, Mr. Lee Kuan Yew came into the picture. Although Mr. Lee's focus and energy were then on the establishment of the new, gov of the new government at that time, Mr. Lee kept the grinding agenda in his radar. Our founding Prime Minister Lee Kuan Yew launched the tree planting campaign in June 1963. And now tree planting has become a movement. Later we'll talk more about it. Mr. Lee planted the pink mumpak, Tretrozylum formosum, a beautiful tree bearing gorgeous flowers, as you can see in the photo. Some say the flower have resemblance to Sakura. You see the green new tree today, very visible. You can't miss the trees. They are everywhere in Singapore now. Hope the next few slides of trees will delight you. This is our iconic East Coast Parkway, having a special green tunnel formed from overlapping canopies of 
of mature rain trees. This is another beautiful green tunnel road, Cashew Road. It's a road, it's a major road leading into the HDB heartland. This is North Buena Vista, lined with trumpet trees blooming. I'm always thrilled when I drive along this dairy farm road. Quite awesome. Many may not know this road is an industrial road that is rather harsh. Then we added in more trees in this Jurong Island Highway. Looks softened and cool now. This is a minor road in a private housing estate, beautifully lined with trees and plants. Down, this is a big park with lots of trees. Some of you may know East Coast Park, the most popular park in Singapore. Esplanade Park, this photo was taken in the evening and it enhances the visual impact of row of mature yellow flame trees. I personally like this park, though a little quiet and serene, Henrich Park. I encourage you to visit if you have not done so. Bukit Batu Nature Park, well visited by uh, joggers. We see a great diversity of trees all over Singapore, very pervasive trees with different forms, an abundance of flowers of different colors, trees bearing a whole range of fruits even. After 50 years of greening efforts, we have successfully transformed Singapore into a city in a garden. In 2017, Singapore was declared the greenest city in the world after MIT Sensible City Lab carried out a field-based study using the Google Street View to calculate the Green View Index to determine the amount of green canopy coverage that you see at street level. Singapore came up to be number one, 29.3%. Now I have to reverse, so to speak, from the excellent greenery today to the landscape of the early years of our garden city. In 1960, the early gardeners, some are still around, is my respectful way of calling these people as gardeners because they touch tree every day. They help to till the ground. They sweater out with the workers. They planted the trees. We tend our early pioneers for the big tree in Singapore we see today. Singapore is a very blessed country because it's warm and wet. The climate support plant growth. And we have many tropical trees that are highly vegetative. That means they can sprout quickly new roots and new shoots. We can literally just take a tree branch into the ground and it grew up to become a tree. Many such trees form the backbone of a garden city. I borrow this few diary page from one retired officer who is now 83 years old. He recorded his plantings. For example, the Ansana tree along Orchard Road, he transplanted in 1967. Orchard Road, on the right side of the picture are the Ansana trees. Maxwell Road, Ansana trees abutting the old red dot traffic building. Rain, rain trees in front of Istana, Ocho Road, very majestic. This slide illustrates no, no trees at Cliff up here. And then 10 years later, the road was quite green because it was planted up. I wish to show you a few trees that started our garden city. The first one, this is Ansana tree, Terocarpus syndicus, quite fast growing. However, it has one weakness, that is, is susceptible to a fungal growth disease, the disease that has killed many of our Ansana trees. Nowadays, you don't see that many Ansana trees in our current landscape. Of course, this is our umbrella-shaped rain tree, Salmonia salmon, is spreading large crown and bright, very good shape even well loved by Mr. Lee Kuan Yew. This is still our most commonly planted tree species even today. 
Yellow flame tree, Delta Forum Terocarpon. Yellow flame has been our old faithful tree species, and we are still planting it because the tree is robust in growth and bears nice yellow flowers. In the 1980s, we introduced more new trees, natives as well as any tropical trees from outside Singapore that can grow and adapt well here. This trumpet tree, Tabubea rosia, looks splendid when in bloom. It was brought in from South America. Their tree, Golden Panda, came from Queensland, Australia. They are also doing very well here, producing stunning yellow bunches of flowers. In the 1990s, our planting efforts were intensified. We went overseas to source for more new trees and plants that could give us greater vibrancy in terms of colors. In this picture, you see Cyzeum mitifolium. Trees with bright young foliage now planted everywhere. It's a native tree of Singapore. The tree also produces pretty flowers, white or pink flowers according to the varieties you plant. We popularized the planting of a yellow rain tree. The yellow rain tree in this picture are growing at the center medium of Victoria Street. The trees have made the character of the street look more unique. The Kasai tree, Pometia pinata, gives out very brightly colored reddish young leaves. This tree comes from Southeast Asia, a very good urban tree. As we move into the year 2000, we wanted to be a little bit more creative. We conceptualized the SGMP, Streetscape Greenery Master Plan, to guide us in street tree planting. We have five thematic treatment types, pathway, coastal, rural, forest, gateway. And we have some pictures to show you the various thematic planting along the various roads in Singapore. In the last decade, over 10 years, EMPA has promoted many greenery programs and initiatives, most of which are anchored on trees. EMPA's core business revolves around trees. Trees always matter to us. In recent years, we have more passionate and creative people with innovative ideas on tree planting, on landscaping, a new landscape came up and that is creating nature way. And what is that? Meaning planting up the road verge to be a linear forest with multi-tiered trees and plants, mimicking nature as you see in the forest. As you can see in the illustration, we have tall emergent trees, the slightly shorter canopy layer trees, then come the understory layer trees before the lowest level of undergrowth consisting of smaller shrubs. So in uh, nature planting, we attempt to create a little forest in an urban setting. Quite a novel thing. I have not seen it done in any other countries. One good example is the Tunga Nature at Bukibato. Uh, next, we have the Henderson Nature Way, beautiful. Another significant noble thing is that we involve more people to carry out the nature planting as a community project. We plant together with the minister, with the MP, with the grassroots leaders and the school children. We select the right species of trees and shrub to plant in the nature ways. Those that bear flowers with nectar or, or are host plants for caterpillars. So they attract a lot of butterflies and songbirds enriching the biodiversity of our urban landscape. Yes, biodiversity is a catch word nowadays, good for Singapore as a highly built up city. Recently, people are becoming more appreciative of urban greenery that is naturalistic, a little more wild, well, a little less medical. Why? Because we as humans are innately biophilic. We want to connect with nature that should be encouraged, for we are going back to nature, so to speak. A lot of people ask, why is Singapore so successful in greening up the city? We, what have we done right? I offer you four success factors. 
The first success, uh, success factor, we have excellent support from the government and the people. For this, I have to repeat mentioning one person again, and that is our, fund, our founding Prime Minister, Lee Kuan Yew. Without Mr. Lee, there will be no greening as you see today. Started by him and we work alongside him. Mr. Lee personally provide us the vision. He directed the Garden City effort, facilitated all the supporting policies and all this continues to today. Allow me to say a little more on Mr. Lee Kuan Yew. His insightful vision was so far ahead of time. Right from the beginning of his term as Prime Minister of Singapore, he was already set to make Singapore a green oasis in this region of the world. Mr. Lee envisioned Singapore to be a garden city with neat greenery that will attract businessmen and tourists to come here. I got this quote from his memoirs. Yes, because our first rate greenery, we have attracted many international businessmen, investors and tourists to come here and they are sustaining the economy of Singapore today to allow period for now because of the viral pandemic. In the media report, when Mr. Lee Kuan Yew passed away in 2015, he was lovingly referred to as Singapore Chief Gardener. The spirit of Singapore of Lee Kuan Yew lives on. We salute you, Mr. Lee Kuan Yew, sir. The second success factor is that we have terrestrial land with true ground to plant our trees and shrubs. We have provided the land. We have road bridges to plant trees. We plant trees in car parks. Of course, we have specially allocated parcels of land for parks, for nature reserve, and even for green buffer beside buildings and drains. Especially for streetscape, we have the tree, we have the road code that will allocate land for various agencies. For MPARs, we have provided with definite green verges. For example, as shown in illustration, uh, in a typical major road, we have three green verges consisting of the center medium and two roadside verges. The road code sets the typology of the roadscape in the whole of Singapore. We are always assured we have land allocated for planting our roadside trees. Third success factor is that Singapore has proper legislation. Flowing from legislation, we draw up appropriate policies and governance guidelines to empower us, to help us implement the whole business of greening up Singapore. Last but very, very important success factor, the people factor. Without the right people in our business, you can forget about Garden City. We have many dedicated staff whose passion are to make things happen. Someone has commented well, saying, chlorophyll instead of hemoglobin flows in your blood. What a testimony of dedication come on us. Our empire staff are constantly trained to be highly professional in terms of knowledge and skill. All our planted trees are specially cared for. We carry out structural pruning, for example, for safety reasons, like the double-decker uh, buses, so that they can pass safely below the tree crown. We use a state-of-the-art diagnostic devices, such as in the left most photo showing the Picus a sonic tomograph, using sound waves to determine the extent of decay inside the tree trunk tissues. And Naboris is a trained person who knows how to care for the trees. As you can see in the slide, he looks like a modern warfare soldier, fully equipped to fight, not just for the survival of the tree, but for his continual useful and safe life expectancy. Nowadays, Naboris work closely with researchers for new ways to enhance the structural stability of trees, we use smart technology in our work. For example, we fly drone to inspect the tree crown. We, de we deploy LIDAR to capture tree information. Former US Vice President Al Gore says, we must plant trees, lots of trees because of global warming. Because of urban heat island, Singapore government has initiated the Cooling Singapore Project. Planting tree is certainly part of the solution 
to plant trees. That is the right thing we all must do. Planting tree is an activity that will outlast you and leave you a good legacy. Now we are moving on to a new vision from city in the garden to city in nature. We are embarking on the One Million Trees movement. I'll let my colleague, Dr. Adrian Rowe, to continue the narrative. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. T, for the interesting and comprehensive overview of the history of tree planting in Singapore. Indeed, we have to thank our forefathers for their pioneering spirit in greening Singapore and making it the vibrant and livable city we see today. It also suddenly gave me a lot more appreciation for all the greenery we get to enjoy. Now, Dr. Lu will introduce us to the next phase of our greening journey, the One Million Trees Movement. Just a reminder, if you have any questions, do submit them in the Zoom chat, and we will try to present some of them during the Q&A session later on. Dr. Lu, please. Hi, hi there. Um, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, thanks for spending your afternoon with us. And I want to really thank uh, Mr. T for this wonderful, uh, inspiring walk through our uh, Singapore's uh, green, greenery history. It was really very inspiring for me as well to see um, all the efforts uh, done by our forefathers. And I just want to touch on the One Million Trees movement. And you know, they say that when you plant a tree, you're not really planting for yourself, but actually for the next generation. So as we can see, um, we have really benefited from the, the foresight of our, our great leaders. Uh, yeah. Next slide. So um, our greening history isn't new and it started decades ago. Uh, and um, it started from garden city to city in a garden and then now to city in nature. Uh, more and more, we are seeing that nature benefits us. Um, and it's almost like important it is important for us for our survival you know and um, through sequestration carbon sequestration to providing um, shelter um, and from you know our tsunamis um, and to fight uh, in helping us fight against climate change so one of our, the key strategies in our city in nature vision really outlines uh, how um, we also can benefit uh, from protecting nature. The first uh, strategy would be extending our natural capital. I'll touch on that a bit later about our nature parks and how it plays a role in extending our natural capital from our core areas. Then um, another strategy is intensifying nature in our gardens and parks. How we are bringing our nature, um, our native uh, fauna, uh, into our gardens and parks through the intensification of our planting of native trees. And also Mr. T touched on how we are restoring nature back into the urban landscape through some of these nature ways. And, um, and one key uh, important movement is the One Million Trees movement uh, where we will be planting lots of trees in the urban landscape and a lot of native trees as well. Uh, fourthly, um, the city in nature vision is also about strengthening connectivity between our green spaces. Um, one can only look at um, the, 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 the problems um, in, in the West with um, the extinction of a lot of bees um, and know that um, it's very important that these bees, uh, insects, uh, our, our birds and all that can travel from one greenery area, one core area to another with uh, connectivity. Uh. So connectivity is very important for the resilience of uh, biodiversity uh, so that they can fight against extinction. Underlying this right, um, city and nature vision is that everyone has a role to play. Uh. Um, and how are we going to be involving people in this? It's through the planting of one million trees and we hope that um, the community can um, pick up their chunkles and help us plant that one million trees as well. Yeah. Next slide. So this is a new paradigm, and it's really about applying nature-based solutions to achieve climate resilience, ecological resilience, and social resilience. Uh, planting trees as a community or being able to enjoy our nature parks um, really gives us the lift that we need, um, especially in this time of the pandemic. Um, we also realize that everybody is seeking refuge in our nature reserves and nature areas 
um, every weekend uh, we have kept our parks open. Um, we have um, we have safe distance measures to make sure that our park users and our citizens can enjoy our parks uh, and get a respite, you know. And and what more, you know, that um, the outdoor area is so safe and welcoming and so therapeutic as well. Next slide. So when we, as, as I said, when we plant trees, we really never plant for our own, but for the next generation. And when Mr. Lee Kuan Yew started the tree planting movement, he gave us a real sustainable future through our greenery. Uh, and um, these 1 million trees over the next 10 years that uh, we will be planting uh, will be um, really a continuation of that legacy and to restore nature back into our city, not only for the biodiversity that we see in Singapore, but really also for ourselves, uh, our survival. Yeah. Next slide. Why one million trees? I mean, very, firstly, is to increase shade, um, to take away the urban heat island effect, uh, increase ecological connectivity. And trees also sequester carbon. It's a very uh, carbon, carbon dioxide. Uh, it's a greenhouse gas. And the more we sequester it through um, uh, the planting of trees, um, the, the, the best um, we, we, we can help mitigate against climate change. Uh. And not only that, uh, we've seen um, that in areas where you plant a lot of trees, um, you will get um, lowering of heat. And not only that, um, you don't only get lowering of heat uh, through the shade, you also get lowering of heat through uh, evapotranspiration. Uh, plants transpire. And I've seen uh, really uh, videos of um, uh, uh, water, you know, um, um, water coming out of trees <laughs> um, in, in experiments, uh, water coming out of plants, um, gushing out uh, to just show that lots of water actually is lost through the trees and um, it actually re reduces the heat from the ground as well. Next slide. I just want to take some time to highlight um, a few trees here. Um, this is the, if you can see that this logo is uh, everywhere. Uh, in our our website and in our presentations, um, this one million trees movement is actually uh, the tree on the left um, in Bukit Timah Nature Reserve. It's just after Singpang Hut. You can actually go and see it. Um, it's Compasia malachensis. Um, it's a legume, uh, meaning it, it belongs to the bean family. Uh, the Malay name for this is Kempas. It's a very tall tree, over 60 meters. And um, it's really the first tree that we planted for the one uh, million tree movement. Uh, Ms. Minister Desmond Lee planted it in April uh, during the pandemic. And it was, um, he planted it alone, um, but he, we, are, we are inviting the community to plant along. And what's so beautiful about this tree is that um, when we plant this tree, it will really grow into a very tall tree. Um, it will live on and it will live through uh, many generations um, over, um, and you will see through a lot of the trials and struggles that we have, a lot of the celebrations that we have, the successes that we have, and um, the tree will still remain standing and look upon us, you know, um, as it grows uh, taller and taller. Yep. Um, this is another tree, um, uh, another native tree. So. In our one million tree movement, you'll see that, um, as Mr. T also mentioned, we'll be planting a lot of our native trees. Uh. And this is one uh, very beautiful native tree, uh, Sindora walichii. Uh, the Malay name for this is Sepetia Daun Tema. You can see this, um, this tree on the right of your screen. It's, called, uh, it's at Nether Ravon Road, Nether Avon Road, sorry, in Changi. Um, it's within the compound of a chalet. And it's a very tall tree, um, standing at maybe about 30 meters tall. And we believe it to be an offspring of the tree on the left that you see here. This tree on the left is very interesting. Um, it's, uh, it's the legendary Changi tree. Um, it was so tall, it was about 76 meters tall. Uh. So if you imagine a, a, a 20 story or 20 over story building, uh, that's how tall uh, this tree is. Uh. Yeah. You can see in the picture, if you look closely, um, there's a two-story building um, just near the foot of the tree. Um, so you can imagine um, how tall this tree was. In 1942, 
if I'm not, yeah, 1942, um, the British soldiers actually had to blow the top of this tree uh, using um, explosives because they were afraid that the Japanese would use the, the tree as a ranging for their artillery, as a range for their artillery, a target for their artillery. So uh, they blew this with explosives. Too. Yeah. So if you go to this website, Habitat News uh, uh, website, uh, shown on the left here, um, you will um, really read a nice story about this uh, legendary tree. Uh. It's so tall. So the tree lives on in its, um, in its offsprings. So if you want to see this tree, there's a, it's a heritage tree along Changi. Um, and um, go and visit it. It's a very really beautiful tree. It has uh, this very spiny uh, seed pods. Um, interestingly, if you pick up the seed pods, uh, there's some exudate coming from the spine. It, it smells like lime. Yeah. So this, um, this, this tree is dispersed by uh, rodents. It has a, rodents and small mammals. It has a small, it has a seed, a pea, one single seed uh, with uh, some, uh, a small piece of flesh uh, that is very juicy, I guess, for the animal, uh, for it to, to disperse. Yeah. So, in our one million tree movement, we'll be planting um, a lot of native trees. Uh, and the reason for planting native trees is to really um, provide um, food and flowers um, for our native uh, insects uh, and uh, animals as well. Trees provide uh, ecosystem services. Um, and, and I think we've all learned this either in school or, uh, or you know, right now on, on, on the websites um, and and really ecosystem services uh, is about how nature actually protects us. Um, our mangrove ecosystem is very important because they act as uh, nurseries, uh, nurseries for young fish, you know, uh, much like the nurseries that our young kids uh, go to. So um, the roots of the, the, the mangroves provide shelter for this um, young fish and they grow and then they'll swim out back into the sea uh, where they'll become adults. And then um, these mangroves are very important because um, they, they allow the young fish to hide from predators. So that's how they provide um, um, really um, a new harvest, you know, a sustainable harvest uh, for the ocean. Um, more and more, we are seeing that um, uh, nature also provides us with um, a respite. Uh, with, um, to help us in our mental health as well through recreation, nature-based learning, or just simply for just walks, uh, for exercise. Uh. Um, then there's nutrient cycling and then air purification and also microclimate uh, cooling. Uh. We'll show that in the next few slides. So these are just uh, some of the literature that you can find online, um, scientific literature that shows how nature actually can help um, um, in, in our lives, our daily lives as well. And Singapore is prominently featured in um, a lot of articles on um, livable cities as well. Yeah, next slide. Um, and um, there are a lot of psychological and health benefits that nature provides us. Um, if you find yourself very distracted, all you have to do is actually look out the window and then look at some trees and you realize that you get back your um, attention. So this is uh, basically attention restoration therapy. And somehow it helps to let your mind uh, rest. And uh, then after that, you can better focus. So, so we've also have studies with uh, NUHS where we've seen that um, this uh, nature-based therapy um, helps uh, people also in their immune system. Um, there's this interleukin-6 uh, that is seen to actually uh, improve uh, the levels of this interleukin-6, uh, improves uh, in the elderly uh, when they, they, uh, they spend more time uh, in greenery. Yeah. Next slide. So um, on the left, you can see that uh, this is an industrial estate, um, notoriously uh, very hot because um, there's a lot of built up uh, concrete and tarmac. But uh, if we were to plant um, more trees and if you can see that the pallet that we use these days uh, is the nature way pallet, um, many layers of uh, trees, which means many leaves um, and you increase what is called your leaf area index. And when you do that, um, there's a higher rate of ev uh, evaporation and there's obviously more shade also. 
Um, and this really cools down the climate by uh, quite, a, quite a significant percentage. Okay, if you watch closely, um, this is one of our modeling, um, environmental modeling. Um, if we play it, you will see that the temperatures of these uh, hotspots uh, actually uh, changes by about six degrees Celsius. Yeah, just by planting trees alone. So um, it's not very difficult to imagine. Um, sorry, you go back to one slide, please. It's not very difficult to imagine this kind of planting. Uh, and as um, uh, Mr. T presented just now, a lot of our nature ways actually are, are looking like that right now. Um, and, um, and it not only creates that kind of uh, pervasive greenery um, that's very pleasant to the eyes, but having a structure like that allows... Um, even uh, uh, different types of different species of native birds to rest. Uh, because if you were to have one layer, you would only attract a certain kind of uh, species of birds. But if you have many layers, right, um, you will attract uh, birds that may prefer um, the lower layer or may prefer the understory. Yeah, so, so it actually increases the, the biodiversity along these ways as well as they act as nature ways as well. Next slide. So um, in our One Million Tree Program, um, besides uh, planting on our streetscape, um, some of our planting sites are gardens and parks. Um, this is in the Singapore Botanic Gardens. Um, and um, what we have done is we've recreated a swamp. Um, uh, we have re-enhanced it into a swamp um, at the Learning Forest um, based on historical records of the flora there. And um, by planting more and more native trees there, um, we are beginning to attract more um, biodiversity there. And if you are lucky, you will see some otters also frolicking um, here and uh, in the botanic gardens as well. Yeah. This is one of our uh, restoration sites um, in, um, around our nature reserve. And I believe this is in um, Rifle Range Nature Park. Some of these are uh, invasive plants. You can see some of the um, tapioca and uh, some of the invasive climbers. Um, so what we have done here is that we've removed some of these invasive climbers. Uh, they overgrow uh, the forest and sometimes they will um, overgrow very quickly and kill off some uh, of the trees. So it's very important for us to take these uh, invasive species away and then plant native trees as well. Um, we plant a diversity of native plants and the native plants are food sources for uh, native uh, for our fauna as well. Native birds, um, um, our primates, our terrestrial uh, mammals as well. So by planting native species, you support um, the conservation of our native fauna as well. Next slide. Um, if you look closely at the bottom right of your screen, you'll see actually a porcupine, a family of porcupine. Um, they like to travel in groups like that. Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's, quite a, it's a quite a rare sighting, <laughs> and, uh, but they are found in, over here, this is in Thompson Nature Park. Um, and um, you can see that in our nature parks, we do plant uh, interesting species for species recovery. On the left, you can see a very rare rambutan. It's the hairless rambutan, uh, Nephilim mengei. Um, it's, um, it's not as fleshy as um, the rambutans that we eat, but uh, it's a native rambutan. And it provides food for the uh, monkey you see there. That's a Raffles banded langer. Um, the Raffles langer um, in the 80s and maybe the 70s, there were only maybe about the reportedly uh, about five to 10 individuals left. But today, um, we, we count 60 in our midst. And uh, it's very important that we um, restore some of our nature parks with um, native species that support the diet of um, such uh, rare endangered uh, animals uh, for their conservation as well. And uh, of course, the straw-headed bubu is a very beautiful songbird. Uh, it, it's very melodic. And um, because it's very melodic in the region where it is, um, um, it has shown that um, there's very high rates of poaching of this bird. And surprisingly, um, the, the, 
the distribution of this bird is in Southeast Asia. And surprisingly, Singapore being so small, um, it is the stronghold for this uh, particular species. Um, thanks to our strong laws here and also um, the pockets of um, nature reserves um, that we have protected uh, over the years. Um, in Pulau Ubin also, uh, this, you can hear this very uh, melodic bird um, if you walk through um, Pulau Ubin um, in, in the early morning or in at dusk. Uh, these are crepuscular animals, uh, so they will, uh, they will be active uh, in the mornings and the evenings. Uh, and really, uh, the whole uh, Pulau Ubin, um, especially the forested areas, uh, will be punctuated by the beautiful song of this bird. Next slide. So um, part of the city in nature vision is uh, safeguarding our core habitats. Um, this, um, it extends the habitat for our biodiversity and it protects our nature reserves uh, from um, abutting developments and it reduces visitorship uh, pressure on nature reserves. All you have to do these days is go to Bukit Timah on a weekend and you'll see that it's uh, really very busy. Um, people love uh, Bukit Timah Nature Reserves. Uh. Um, so the upcoming Rifle Range Nature Park just serves to um, provide that kind of relief for uh, Bukit Timah Nature Reserve. So um, we hope that uh, visitors will also spread themselves out to these um, nature parks and um, allow some of the, allow the forest to rest as well. Next. So uh, recently, uh, we we uh, announced uh, Sungai Bulo uh, Nature Park Network. Um, this is a very important uh, network because um, it supports migratory birds that come and uh, uh, stop over in Sungai Bulo Wetland Reserves. And if you see uh, Mandai Mangrove and Mud Flat, uh, this is a very important complementary habitat for the birds because uh, the birds that fly to Sungai Bulo um, will actually fly to Mandai mud flat uh, when it's uh, low tide because the mud flat gets exposed. And so the birds will roost in Sungai Bulo Wetland Reserves and then uh, when the tide is low, they'll go and feed at Mandai Mangrove and then they will fly back to Sungai Bulo uh, Wetland Reserves. And um, our nature park network isn't really uh, just for um, animals alone. It is also for people to enjoy. So we sensitively create um, um, uh, enhance some of the trails that are uh, on existing uh, trails already. We will build like um, boardwalks uh, over these uh, trails uh, so that animals can go under the boardwalk and there's going to be less impact uh, when people are walking through this. And some of these trails will be away from uh, core areas um, so that um, the activities of people won't um, really impact the sensitive biodiversity there. So in uh, likewise, our Central Nature Park Network uh, serves to protect core areas like Bukit Timah Nature Reserves as well as our Central Catchment Nature Reserve. You can see that um, this actually form a blanket around our uh, very precious Bukit Timah Nature Reserves on the left. Yeah, next slide. So we have a forest restoration action plan and we invite you all to be part of it as well. Um, we hope to plant two, two, 250,000 trees and shrubs um, over the next 10 years as well in this forest restoration action plan. Um, it's really to uh, plant up more native trees uh, in our nature parks um, as well. And um, because our nature parks um, are filled with um, exotic species like um, like rubber trees and oil palms and so these are not native so they don't really totally support native uh, species but we hope that by planting more native species and primary rainforest species uh, we will see the kind of uh, intense structure that you see uh, like in Bukit Timah Nature Reserve. If you were to look closely at the figure on the right you will see a little bump on the tree and uh, that little bump is actually a Malayan colugo. So this Caligo, um actually um, rest, is resting here um, during daylight, but at night it's uh, pretty active. Uh, it will eat fruits um, and it will glide around in the forest. It's a very beautiful creature that's closely related to um, uh, primates. Um, but uh, this is what I mean by um, we want to reduce the kind of visitorship pressure uh, on our core areas. So by having... Uh, more nature park networks, um, we, we will be able to 
um, allow such creatures to rest at night as well. That's also the one of the reasons why we close our nature reserves uh, and nature parks at 7 p.m. Um, so in the day you get uh, people using it and but uh, and the animals will be sleeping and then at night the animals are coming out. So it's very biphasic. Yeah. Next slide. So um, part of this um, uh, one million tree uh, movement is also to improve the forest around the rivers and mangrove, um, coastal areas as well, um, so that we can allow biodiversity to thrive. Part of our city in nature uh, vision is also to allow connectivity. Uh, and on the left is a is the eco link at BKE. It's a very beautiful bridge, uh, very lush in uh, greenery right now. We have seen uh, animals such as the slow lorries, uh, the mouse deer, and the pangolin using uh, the, the, the eco link. Um, on the right, you can see that um, in more urban areas, we are planting, planting up um, nature ways as well. So do look out for these nature ways. They're very interesting and they're many layered and they're really very, um, uh, very nice uh, sight uh, to the eyes. Uh. Next slide. So um, this is a call to all of you. Uh, we need you to uh, help us in our one million trees. Um, uh, you don't have to be a minister to plant a tree. <laughs> um, anyone can plant a tree. Um, school children, um, you know, anyone, um, any, any shape and size uh, can plant this tree. Um, it's tough work, I tell you. Um, the, if you see the picture on the right here, um, the, there's a tree planting um, event here. Um, uh, just, uh, just, they just happened a few days ago. So there are some safe distance measures. We kept it to five, um, but they planted, I think, about 30 trees nonetheless. Um, and, um, and if you can see, uh, you, the, if you join us, you'll be actually digging the holes yourself. Um, and so it's very tough work. You'll feel it the next day. Yeah. Next slide. So um, how can you get involved? Um, besides tree planting, we are also hoping that we can involve the community in propagation of some of these seeds that we collect. Um, and as I said earlier, some of the invasive species, uh, we need you to help us get rid of them. Uh, we will be accompanying you and telling you um, what kind of invasive species are there to manage as well. Um, you can also join us uh, in monitoring the growth and also see what kind of biodiversity um, actually thrives there after we have planted a certain area. Yeah. So um, how can you get involved? Uh, if you can look, if you look at this, uh, if you go to this website, trees.sg, or you just type trees.sg on your phone, um, you will see uh, a very um, dynamic website. Um, you can see also the number of trees we planted. Um, currently, it stands at uh, 50 over 51, I think, uh, thousand uh, trees that we have planted. So there's a counter there as well. And there's also a sign-up sheet. And uh, if you have an initiative to suggest, you can actually go to this website as well. And uh, you can sign up for our mailing list also. Yeah, so if you are a corporation, um, uh, Corporations can also be part of this uh, plant a tree program um, through, uh, uh, through our fundraiser, uh, fundraising uh, charity, uh, registered charity, Garden City Fund. Um, they can donate $300 uh, per tree uh, to support our community um, uh, 1 million tree planting. So yeah, spread the news uh, to any corporates that might, be, uh, that might want to get involved in our 1 million trees uh, movement. Okay, I think that's the end of my slide. And I thank you very much for uh, listening uh, to us. Thank you, Dr. Lu, for the inspiring sharing of how everyone can be involved in carrying on efforts of greening Singapore into the future. And that these efforts will help us face modern challenges brought about by climate change and urbanization. Now it's time for our Q&A session. Thank you to everyone in the audience who submitted questions during the session as well as prior to it. The first question is addressed to Mr. T. 
Where can we find the oldest tree in Singapore? Well, there is not an easy question to answer. I believe the oldest tree in Singapore is somewhere in the nature reserve. Uh, just now I already mentioned during the, if you talk about urban tree, we have a few trees that we know roughly the age. For example, the corner drive trees is slightly over, the corner drive rain tree is like over 100 years. The tembusu trees, the $5 tembusu tree in uh, SBG, Botanic Gardens. It, SBG was um, founded roughly uh, 1859, so you add in 40 plus 120, so it's at least, the tembusu tree is at least 160 years old. Whereas the oldest tree, I believe, should be in the nature reserve, which I think we have not, we have not done a proper test to find out exactly how old they are. But we know the ages of the trees along the roadside, the parks, because we have records of them. I hope I answered the question. Um, thank you, Mr. D. Um, our next question, oh, sorry. Yeah, our next question is for Dr. Liu. And uh, sorry, our next question, let me see. Um, it's for Dr. Liu, and it's related to more of the plans to planting into the future. Uh, how can the youth contribute to conservation of trees and the environment? Yeah, so um, actually I see uh, Jacob and a few teachers, uh, Mindy, in, in, the, in the guest list, uh, in the webinar today, um, they, they are really very inspiring uh, as teachers uh, and they've been um, carrying out, um, conducting a lot of programs uh, in their schools um, for, their, for, for the younger generation, uh, um, either through nature walks um, um, and, and also um, I know Jacob has a nursery in his school where, where, where he's planting some of the native seeds that we pass to him um, and the, the, the school children are or the I wouldn't say children. I mean, his secondary school uh, students are actually taking care of these seeds, are uh, nurturing them to a height uh, before we plant them back into the forest. Uh. So that's just one of the ways uh, that they can do. And youth have so much energy and um, and so much ideas. Uh, you know, they they we really invite them to come and join us um, to to really you know. Um, also share with us what they think uh, they can do as well, uh, besides just planting a tree. Uh, so so we, we do invite them because uh, we are full of ideas and uh, they're full of energy. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Lu. Um, another question from our audience directed to Mr. T. Uh, what is this instrument wrapped around the tree? And can you tell us more about how it works? Or oh, is a sonic thermograph or the brand name, <laughs> the one that we bought, you uh, is called Picus. So uh, this device is actually state of art device using sound waves. Uh, as you can see in the photo, there are a lot of sensors. Behind the sensor, we have a, a nail. We nail in so that then we will put a, we will, you'll tap it to create the sound. And the sensor around the, uh, around the trunk will receive the sound waves. And according to the, the tissues, the, the, the health of the tissue, those who are dead tissue will prevent or retard the, the sound wave from reaching from one end to the other. And will be captured by all the sensors and will be converted by our algorithm. And then we will be able to form a tomogram, maybe a cross section indicating where are the, the decay areas within the tree trunk. So this device is quite, quite, a, quite a good device because we can determine without, to be too much of the, uh, without being too much invasive into the, into the tree trunk by having this sending in the, the sound waves. Thank you, Mr. T. All right, so for our final question today, before we wrap up uh, for both Mr. T and Dr. Liu, uh, what's your favorite tree species growing along Singapore streets and why? Uh, Mr. T, do you want to share first? Well, I always 
try not to answer this question because <laughs> I'm biased because I regard all trees as quite equal under the sun, so to speak. <laughs> but if there is a tree that I was asked a question quite uh, similar because right now Singapore don't have a national tree. He said, what is your favorite tree? Which I say, what is my possible suggestion of a national tree? I say it has to be a tree that is native to Singapore and it must be strong, it must be robust. And a few species came up. Of course, one of them is uh, Tembusu tree. The other one, of course, is Compasia Excelsa. Uh, no, uh, Compasia malagensis, compass tree. So all these are, to me, lah, my favorites. At least two, I named two. I don't, don't name too many. Uh, Dr. Liu? Yeah, um, okay, so... It's another tough question for me, so because I like a lot of trees, um, and um, it changes from time to time. You know, I will get obsessed with one tree, then I see another tree, then like, wow, you know, I'll read up more about it. But I think if you really ask me to pin one down, I would say uh, Sindora, uh, the Changi tree. It's got so much history and so much story. Uh, Sindora, the the word for Sindora comes from the Sanskrit Sindor, uh, which means um, um, really vermilion. Uh, vermilion means red, huh? Um, because when there's a new flush, right, the whole tree becomes red uh, uh, with uh, young leaves. Uh, and it's a legume. And, uh, and legumes, you know, they actually fix nitrogen and actually provide uh, uh, fertility to the soil. Yeah, so I guess in Dora uh, we are planting these on the street trees. And you can see that a lot, some of the street trees that you see for, uh, of this in Dora are come from the seeds of the one at the Changi. Uh, the Avon Road, yeah. Well, uh, with that, I'd like to thank Mr. T and Dr. Liu for their sharing, and to our audience on Zoom and YouTube for joining us. As mentioned at the start of the talk, we look forward to continue sharing with everyone more about the One Million Trees movement. Do look out for updates on our website, trees.sg, and connect with us on our NPARC social media channels. We're on Facebook, Instagram, Telegram, Twitter, and on YouTube. Thank you all again for attending this session and have a great evening ahead.